just uh, as people filter in, thought I'd go ahead and kind of introduce myself. My name is Dave Kilgore. I am a, a CPI, like AJ said. I am also a full-time inspector with my local AHJ uh, authority having jurisdiction. So um, I currently work as an elevator and electrical inspector. I also still occasionally go out and do uh, some building inspections, things like that. I am also the owner of uh, Kilgore Instruction and Education. It, it's just a, a way for me to help educate people on codes. And uh, I go over specifically building codes and electrical codes and electrical and elevator codes with uh, various companies. Um, no, excuse me. I, I specialize in the initial instruction and continuing education of construction and building codes, basically. Um, I'm a true believer in having as much information as possible when going out and, and, and doing uh, inspections, whether that's in my, my day job as a, a building inspector or, you know, going out doing home inspections um things of that nature I, i'm a true believer in in the more we know the better we are right and uh my goal for today really is to to kind of help just uh help you as a group understand what goes on behind the scenes um as an inspection department that works for an AHJ when it comes to solar install installations because as we've seen um, over the last several years, solar, you know, in our jurisdiction, we would do eight or 10 a year. We're now doing eight to 10 a day. So it's it's just exploding. It's getting crazy how, how many people are having solar panels installed on their roofs. And if you're if you're inspecting those houses that have an existing solar installation on them um and you're in a jurisdiction that doesn't have inspections on them it's going to be totally different than what you would find here in our jurisdiction um so i'm going to i'm going to go through the the process of what the the installers have to go through before they're even allowed to install a single piece of equipment on a roof here in our jurisdiction so a little more um, information about me uh, my background is electrical i've uh, been a master electrician uh, started in the trade in 1988 um, got my journeyman's certificate in 93 got my master's license in 95 um i was an electrical contractor for several years um closed up shop and became an inspector because i felt the need to to help my my uh local community make sure that that everyone's doing things the same way and doing things safely right um i and a CPI with Internachi, and I'm also a, a residential combination inspector with International Code Council, ICC. That's who um, certifies building inspectors um, around the country. Um, basically, what that means is, is I have certifications in electrical, building, um, HVAC, and plumbing. So I'm certified to inspect all of those, those things. Um, as we go through this today, um, if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. If I see something that um, is, is kind of pertinent to what we're talking about, I, I may try to address it then. Um, if not, I may, may just go through the questions, go through the chat at the end of the, the presentation, and we'll see what, where we go from there. Um, there is a question that you know someone asked where where my local HJ is located. I am in Wichita, Kansas. Um, so we're I'm just smack dab in the middle of the country. Um, solar, in and of itself, 
where I am, you know, at, out in the outer edges, you know, California, they've had it forever. Um, we have really just got hit with it over the last couple of years. Um, like I say, we used to do eight to 10 a year. And in the last year, it has just jumped exponentially. Um, with that, it, we have uh, solar installers just crawling out of the woodwork from all over the country. And what we have found is that there seems to be a lot of a lot of installers who who have never truly seen what the codes are that they're supposed to be following. Um, they don't. Uh, they're just going by. Okay, here here here's our equipment. This is how it goes on the roof. This is how stuff goes on the wall we install it and we walk away and there's no there's nobody coming in behind them to see if to make sure it's code compliant not just safe but also code compliant because the codes are here to to make everybody safer all right so you know solar power is becoming a force across the country right now uh solar companies they're blanketing the country um, they're blanking and blanketing entire communities. So what we're seeing here is they're going, you know, they'll they'll pick a part of our our city here and they will just blanket that area. And all of a sudden we'll have 30 solar installations in a a 30 block radius, which is a lot. So um Chances are, if you're not seeing a lot of houses right now with, with solar panels on them, more than likely you're going to see them coming a lot more in the future. Um, obviously, the things that we're seeing today come in into play. Um, we, we typically aren't going to see it as home inspectors until later on. Um, so today I'm going to take a little time to discuss the in installation of solar panels on private residence roofs and what we, the AHJ, um, requires of the installation contractor. We're going to talk about what we as home inspectors should keep an eye out for um, through this process, and um, that will help make our customers feel a little more comfortable that they're buying a, a home with a safe solar installation on it. So in the beginning process, before a uh, solar installer can even deliver materials to a house, they've got to submit some, some paperwork to us. So that paperwork, um, we have to go over as inspectors to make sure that what they're going to install is... Um, it meets all of the applicable codes, whether it's the National Electrical Code or the, the International Residential Code or our local amendments. Now, locally, we don't adopt any specific uh, solar codes. Um, we just go off of those, the, the Residential Code, the Building Code, and the Electrical Code. Uh, so some of the requirements that we have for solar installation paperwork um, we have a, a checklist that they have to fill out. Um, they have to apply for a residential building permit because the installation of the solar panels, it, it changes, it alters the, the engineering of the roof, essentially. You know, we've got to make sure that that roof can handle the load based on wind and snow and all of those things that, that go along with that. Um, they have a, a specific PV or solar application they have to fill out, and they have to submit a complete set of plans, um, as well as a structural analysis that has to be signed by, in our jurisdiction, a, a Kansas engineer, a Kansas professional engineer. If they, if they deliver a set of plans that's stamped by someone in Pennsylvania, we will not accept that. We we require it to be stamped by an engineer in Kansas that's licensed here. Um, and what they have to have to say in that that they have to prevent present a letter 
stating that the roof can support the added load of the rails, the electrical, the solar panels, and I'll go a little more in depth in those documents. Um, so the job of the inspector at this point is to be a plans reviewer. As an inspector, we've got to determine that the installation proposed is code compliant and the reviewer must understand all of the solar components, how they relate to each other, all codes that apply to the system, whether it's the NEC, the IRC, or the IBC, so the National Electrical Code, International Residential Code, or International Building Code. Um, again, we don't, we don't adopt any specific solar codes at this time. And we also have to know how to thoroughly read and interpret a set of plans and one-line documents. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up Uh, so, so I hope you could see that on your screen there. Um, this is our checklist that we make them fill out. So they have to have this is for the expedited permitting process. It's got to have a site plan showing the location of major components of solar system and other equipment on the roof or legal accessory structure. So if they're going to put that solar system on um, a detached garage or a shed or anything of that nature, that has to be a part of this. The plan's got to represent the relative location of components at the site, including but not limited to the location of the array, the existing electrical service location, the utility meter, where the inverter is going to be, the system orientation and tilt angle, and the plan should show access and pathways that are compliant to local codes. Um, they've got to give us a code sheet representing current lo adopted local codes, a one-line electrical diagram, engineered stamp by a state registered professional engineer, specification sheets for all manufactured components. And on those specification sheets, we require everything to be UL listed. There's a lot of solar panels that are being installed out there that are not UL listed. So that's something to keep, keep a lookout for. Um, all diagrams and plans include the following. Got to include the project address section, block, and lot number of the property. So they have to go in and they actually have to provide the legal description of the property they're putting the solar on. The owner's name, address, and phone number. The name of the address and phone number of the person is preparing the plans. And the total valuation of the project. Now, we require that because in our jurisdiction, all, all uh, permits, all building permits are based on the valuation of the project. So here's the checklist. So does the solar installation have a rated capacity of 30 kW or less? The solar installation is not subject to review by architectural historical review. So if it's going on a, a historic home, um, something that's on the, the historic registry, that could be a problem. Um, the solar installation does not need zoning variants or special use permit conditioning, conditional use permit. Um, if the zoning of the area does not allow for uh, the solar installation, that could be a problem. So the solar installation is to be mounted on a permitted roof structure of a building on a legal structure or ground mount on residential property. It's compliant with all applicable electrical and building codes. That's a big one for us because um, a lot of them that come into town aren't initially. Um, it's, the installation is compliant with all local fire codes. The solar installation contractor complies with all licensing and other requirements of 
our, our department, MABCD. The proposed equipment is permitted by code and equipment meets all relative, all relevant certification standards. The electric system and all components will be installed per the manufacturer's specifications. The project will comply with the latest adopted National Electrical Code requirements. The roof has no more than just a single layer of roof covering in addition to the solar equipment. That's a big one there. If there's multiple layers of, of shingles on there, the chances that that solar array is going to come loose from the roof is, is pretty high. The system is to be mounted parallel to the roof surface or tilted with no more than an 18 inch gap between the module frame and the roof structure. System will have a distributed weight of less than five pounds per square foot and less than 45 pounds per square foot per attachment point to the roof. So if any of those questions are no, then their application process stalls at that point and it create and um, it creates more work for everybody because then some more research has to be done. So the, I'm gonna get into the, the PV application itself. So here, here what we require the property owner's information. Is it going on a one or two family structure, a townhouse, commercial or other? Um, if it's if it's going on a commercial property or an agricultural property or some industrial property, a lot more hoops have to be jumped through. They've got to provide the total system capacity rating, which is the sum of all the panels, every panel that they have on it, everything that it adds up to the contractor's information, what the existing roof material is, what type of weatherproofing they plan on using to seal the holes when they, they put the lag bolts through the roof, and is the mounting structure an engineered product designed to mount solar electric modules to? We got to have this mounting system manufacturer, the product name and number, the total weight, the total number of attachment points that are going to be on the roof, weight per attachment point, the maximum spacing between the points on the rail, the total surface area of solar electric modules. How much space on that roof is it actually going to take up? How many square feet? And the distributed weight. So 2.53 pounds per square foot. We've got to have the, the amount, the quantity of inverters, the make and model of those inverters, and then also the, the PV modules themselves, the solar panels themselves. How many of that's going to be? The make and the model number. We require this information because when we go out to do the, the actual inspections, um, we match that with the, the information they've provided us. So if they have changed the model of solar panel that they're installing, which actually happens pretty often because the technology changes so rapidly that Sometimes they sell a project, and when it's time to actually order the material, have it delivered, and install it, those modules are no longer made. Um, it, it's pretty incredible how quickly that that turnover happens. So if if this model number has changed, then they have to resubmit that information to us. So the next step of the process is the actual building permit application. Again, we've got to have the all of the pertinent information, all of the contact information, 
what subcontractors they're going to use. Now, we require all solar installers in our jurisdiction to be licensed where we are. Um, so they come into town. If they don't have a license, then they have to provide some documentation proving that they can be licensed with us. And unless they are a licensed electrical contractor with us, then they are not allowed to do any of the electrical work. We require all electrical work, whether it's for a, a, the solar installation itself, tying into a panel, tying into the meter, all of that can only be done with, by a, a licensed electrical contractor and the certified journeyman or master electricians. So for this, they've got to have a electrical subcontractor. So type of improvement, obviously, it, we, we don't have solar as, as an option, so it's an other. It's a single family home that this is going on. Yes, it does have utility meters. It does have city water. Um, some things don't aren't really relevant on our building permit to solar installations, but they're still required to fill everything out. The valuation of the product, uh, the project. So this is where we come up with how much that building permit is going to cost. So this installation, according to the contractor, is going to cost forty nine thousand dollars to put in. So one of the, the big things that we require, like I mentioned, we have an engineer, they have to provide a letter. It's gotta have who the company is that they're providing this for, where the installation's going, and it has to meet all of our codes. So we are currently under the, the 2018 edition of the International Residential Code. And in our location, we're wind exposure category C, ground snow load, 15 PSF, 115 mile an hour gust wind speed. The existing roof structure, they have to explain how that's built and what the Roofing material is in the slope. They also have to say how that's going to be mounted to the roof. So they actually have to confirm exactly how that's going to be installed on the roof. And so that when we go out to do our inspections, we don't we verify that as well to make sure that they actually have used these products, the screws, and no more than 48 inches on center along the rails. Again, you can see that this was stamped by a local or a state certified engineer. Hey, Dave, we got some questions if you want. Yeah. Okay, some built up here. So, so what about if an owner is doing it? Um, in our jurisdiction, we don't allow homeowners to do uh, PV installations um, just because of, of the nature of them, even if it's uh, quote unquote off grid, right? Um, a lot of people will say, well, I'm not tying into the service. They're still potential for death if you do it wrong potential for fire there's there's potential of, of grave injury if it's done wrong so we require um only licensed installers to do any kind of solar installations in our jurisdiction i have seen an owner install their own pv array um i have yet to see one do it correctly doesn't mean they're not out there um again but that's why we don't we don't allow homeowners to do their own pv array uh someone asked if kansas subsidizes solar um right now no kansas does not 
Um, I think all the states around us do. Kansas doesn't. And to be honest with you, when as many PV arrays as we're seeing just in, in our county, if Kansas subsidized it, it would, I think it would just triple and kind of cripple our inspection department, to be honest with you. Um, we'd have to actually hire some new people to make that work. All right, so good questions. That answer everybody's questions right there, Matt. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, and kind of touch base a little bit on our, go through what we see when a, a set of plans is brought to us. So like I say, based on, on our requirements, they have to have a full set of plans. You'll notice that this set of plans is 15 pages long. We actually have to read every bit of this so that we know, you know, that they're on board. Their plans have to state these things. The utility interconnection application must be approved and PV system inspected prior to parallel operation. The ground fault detection and interruption device is integrated with the microinverter. So probably not going to get too much into inverters, microinverters. Um, there are some AC, there's some DC installations. Um, a lot of the, the, the power coming off the solar panels is DC, and there are certain requirements um, based on those criteria. So like I say, we read through all of these issues. Go through all of the notes that, that they have in here. So this drawing, it, it's in relation to how it's going to be installed. So street, driveway, garage, and this is their, where they're going to be installing the, the solar panels. And on this wall here is where everything's going to be, all the electrical is going to be installed. This is a good one. Uh, if you don't know, um, depending on the roof, how the access goes to the roof, there's a minimum of three feet of clearance that has to be left for firefighter access. So along the sides, along the ridge line, there has to be a three a three foot area for firefighters to access. Um, if that's not there on the plan, it immediately gets kicked back. That's a that's a big requirement. These letters in here indicate what array they're going to use. The A's are one model, the Bs are another model. This one's talking about the, the roofing material, it's asphalt shingle, the flush mount solar mon modules last attached to the roof surface. And, and when we get to the page, it'll actually show the mounting details so that you can see how they're actually going to be mounted to the roof. This is the one line drawing that I was that I was mentioning. Um, one of the things that our local utility, so we have three utilities that we deal with, four utilities that we deal with um, in our jurisdiction. Um, the main one that we deal with, and they're the only ones out of the four that require this, they actually require what's called a production meter. Um, so what that does is that tells them how much energy the solar panels are producing and potentially putting back on the grid. Um, even if it's not a system that's going, that's designed to go back on the grid, they still have that potential to go on the grid and the local utility, they want to know what that, that potential is, how much power is coming back on the grid so that in case they have an outage and they're they've got line crews out working on them they can they'll know the potential of what might be there and they can know where they are and go shut them off so here 
It's coming in from the utility, goes to the utility meter, comes down and hits the main panel, the load center, the breaker box. Over here, we've got the production meter. We have a 60 amp disconnect with 40 amp fuses. This is the communications gateway, this junction box, whether it's a, just a junction box or considered a combiner box. Um, that usually tells us that there. And then these over here are the branches or the strings. Um, PVs typically talked about in strings. So we have two different strings here for this, this particular one. Let's see, what do we got? Okay, so some counties in Florida with net metering require homeowners to shut down their systems during mass power outages. That's fantastic. Um, we don't have that here yet. I think that eventually we'll get there. Um, I, I think that there's some, some potential confusion, though, with that, because if a homeowner's not home and they have a huge power outage, let's say they're on vacation, there's still a chance for that that power to be fed back to the grid. So, but that's good. Let's see. So the three foot are not required in Texas. Um, so that's actually a national code. So Texas, unfortunately, kind of lives by their own their own rules sometimes. So if they're not requiring the three foot walkways to me that that's dangerous but not a lot we can do about texas because they they like say they they do things their own way a lot of things i really enjoy about texas that would scare me just a little bit all right so this just talks about the branch summary so branch one will have an output power of 3,600 watts. Branch two will have an output power of 3,120 watts. I won't get too, too in depth here, but you can see here there's 28 of this model and each one shows what they're capable of and what they're actually doing, what the disconnect is, what the inverters are, all of that. Um, this one's a big one. So the codes require a lot of signage on solar installations. All of these stickers or placards are required to be installed on where the meter is, where the main disconnect is, where the rapid shutdown is installed um and if especially if you have the arrays going to uh, a disconnect on one part of the house and it's and the the electrical meter and everything's on the other side of the house we had we actually require not really a map but signage saying where that is So here's the, the page with the actual installation information, how the racking is going to be installed, how they go down, what, it's, what it potentially should look like in those areas. This is the roof down here. You can see the lower left. This is the roof. This is the, the attachment point, and the rack is up here. Same thing with this one here. You can see how the, the attachment point is and how it attaches to that rack rail right there. Here's the spec sheet. This is the PV module that they're installing. Um, has all of the, the information that we require. This is the microinverter. It's got all of the information that tells us all of the electrical potential that, that we've got to deal with is on here. 
This is a combiner box. Um, I wish it actually had an open picture of it. Um, essentially what a combiner box is, all of the, the string uh, cabling from the arrays goes into this and it ties into um, contact points inside that box. It's not just wire netted together inside that box like a lot of them end up getting. It's actually um, tied to contact points in there. I, I prefer combiner boxes as opposed to uh, junction boxes, but junction boxes are um, allowed. Uh, so the shutdown, rapid shutdown system equipment. So depending on where you are in the country and what code you're under, the system has to shut down in a certain amount of time, whether it is uh, 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Um, it, had, it, it just depends on what code you're on. on at, I think we now, with the latest code that we're under, the shutdown can actually take up to 90 seconds to shut down. And that's all power coming from the, the arrays to any distribution equipment. So some more information on the rails, actually what they are and, and how they're going to be installed. So these, these installation points right there, they're, pre, they're fairly new. Um, previous to these, these installation feet like this, the rails had to actually be in, attached to the trusses underneath the, the roof. These feet right here actually are designed and if installed correctly can just go through the plywood sheeting of the the roof and they actually work fantastically they i was surprised the first time i saw one i didn't think that uh it would be as good as they are but they actually work really really well all right that's it on that um, before we just get to maybe a, a couple of extra questions, if you guys have them, I'm going to show a couple of, uh, I've only got a couple of pictures of some installations here in town. So this is a show up on a job. We, we require two inspections. Um, we require uh, what's considered a rough end inspection and then a final inspection. So on the rough inspection, what we're looking for specifically is the rails, their attachment points. We are looking for, and, and I'll have a picture here in a minute that shows it better. So in this junction box here, all the wires already pulled in. The wire, the conductors have to be solar rated conductors. Can't just use, unfortunately, it's kind of crazy. Can't just use THHN on solar installations. Um, so we, we check the wiring, make sure everything's grounded and bonded correctly, make sure the rails are clipped on and installed per the manufacturer's instructions. And each of the attachment points are installed correctly. We actually even get it into the attic and verify if they're coming through the sheathing that they're coming all the way through like they're required to. It's not just going down through the, the asphalt shingles and just barely into the sheathing. It's gotta go all the way through the sheathing. Uh, here's another one. This one's, a, my opinion, a little nicer. Um, you can see the, the bonding wire here. So this is a bonding wire that bonds those racks together, which bonds the arrays, all the arrays together. Now you'll notice it doesn't go to all four rails. If you're bonding here and here and using the correct attachment points or the, the attachment clips um, in the, on, for the PV arrays, for the panels themselves, everything will then be bonded together.
this is a junction box, but it's it like say everything's just wire netted together. You can see here they they've actually installed a ground bar. There's enough ground wires in that that we require a ground bar. Um, we don't allow all of those just to be twisted together or wire netted together. We want them under a, a bar tightened down, torqued down so that we know they're going to get a good connection. We're not going to lose a bond or a ground. Here's a little better picture of that bonding. So it comes out of the, out of the box, comes down here, and it bonds to this rail. And it goes down and bonds at this rail. Open splices like this are permitted on solar systems. Um, this is DC wire, and this, this open splice is permitted. You don't usually see open splices on wiring these days, but uh, that, that is permitted. Um, Rob, yeah, so should mounts, should mounts be near a truss or anywhere in the sheathing? Depends on the, the mounts that you're using. Um, the manufacturer's instructions will dictate how they can be installed, whether that is has to be on the truss or joist, or it can be anywhere in the sheathing. Like say, um, just in the last, I think the, the foot that I was talking about earlier um, came out less than a year ago is when we started seeing them that could be mounted anywhere on the roof. So it depends on it depends on the the product that you're installing, how it's got to be installed. And as a HJ, we do have codes that we follow. But if a UL listed product can be installed properly, um, differently than what we our codes say, we will actually nine times out of 10 go with the, the product manufacturer's instructions on how to install it. Uh, all right, so this is just an, another one of those boxes. You can see just a little clearer. It's a little better picture. Um, these are the array wires, the array cabling that tie together. It's just a combiner box that, that brings all of that wiring together. Let's see, does an engineer have to sign off, sign off on ground-based arrays? Um, actually, yes. In our jurisdiction, they do. Um, a ground-based array still has, has to handle the load of what's installed on it. So it's got to handle the, the PV modules, and it's also got to handle the snow load and the wind shear. So we, we do require a, an engineer to sign off on even ground-based ground -based arrays. You know, and actually that brings up a, a, a whole other issue. So ground-based arrays are a totally different animal. Um, they follow, a lot of the same rules, but their installation can be totally different and the requirements for protection, um, protection from touching any of the components on the backside, whether that's um, we've seen on the back sides of the panels, the protection that way, we've, we've seen just fencing that keeps people out of it. Um, there's so many things that, that can be dangerous to people. Okay, so if you do an inspection and find other code violations not related to the permit, do you call them out? You know, Doug, that's a great question. Um, probably the the real answer is it depends. Um, if there are violations that I see, electrical violations that I see that aren't life safety, I'll probably just bring it up to them and say, hey, you might you want to get this looked at. If it's a life safety item, something that I would consider a life safety, an open splice that a, a kid could grab a hold of or something like that, then yeah, I'll probably call it out. I won't give them their 
I wouldn't sign off their inspection until all of those things are complete. So I'm, I've got some other pictures that I was hoping to show, but I need to, uh, can't seem to find them for some reason. I don't know what happened. It's not it. Let's see if I can find. And unfortunately, I don't know where those ended up. I did have uh, more pictures of, of things actually on the sides. Okay, so another J asked, uh, do the shingles or roof covering need to have a minimum life expectancy before a system can be installed? Um, honestly, we don't look at that. Um, Typically, an engineer, if they're truly going out and looking at it like they're supposed to before they issue the, the letter that it's okay to install the panels on the roof, they're going to address that. If they don't address that, then there's not a lot we're going to be able to do with it. I'm open to, to any other questions you guys got if you want to keep shooting them at me. Anything? Well, I am, let's see, does this significantly raise the cost of getting new covering? Um, it could. Uh, having a solar array on a roof could significantly raise the cost of it because now they've got to remove the panels, the racking, and then reinstall that. So it's a great question. I think I I would say if if uh, you've only got you know five years left on your roof and you put a solar array on there and everything starts leaking, then it probably would be an issue. Can a regular roofing company do that work? Not in our jurisdiction. They'll have to hire um, someone to remove the panels and racking and reinstall. So yeah, so it could definitely be an issue at that point. Great question. Who? We as home inspectors, how much is the ballpark figure to charge for a PV inspection? Dan, it's it's honestly it, it, on the home inspection side of it, it's it's a little bit out of what we're required to do. Um, I don't think it will necessarily add a, a ton of time to an inspection. Um, when I go to a house as a home inspector, you know, I have to take my code ins enforcement hat off, put my home inspector hat on. If I'm going to a house that that has a PV array on it, I'm going, I'm going to make sure it's bonded. I'm going to make sure there's no open junction boxes. There's no nicks or cuts or abrasions in the wire. So if, if that, uh, if, if, this cable right here, this little cable right here starts getting abrasions on it, it's going to quickly deteriorate that outer jacket and it's going to create an issue. Um, so I look at that. I look for those things. Um, I look for, I make sure that there's no, there's nothing touching the roof. So no wiring, no, none of the PV cabling, um, none of that can touch the roof. Now, if they have conduit, going across a roof and down to a combiner box or where all of the electrical is, 
then it then uh that that can be on the roof and and attached to the roof but the but an open cable that needs to be off the roof um aren't these boxes covered by the paneling Aaron I'm not sure exactly what you're asking if you're asking if it's just if they're protected by the panel, um, maybe, but for a safe installation, this box has to have its cover installed before the PV panel can be installed on top of it. I like these questions. These are great. Keep coming at me. Because I have completely lost. Yeah, so Eric put on there, look up Solodec. Um, yeah, so every junction box or combiner box is required to have, uh, they're required to have covers on them to be code compliant. So Jan, uh, thermal drone camera inspection. Um, I have never done a thermal inspection on PV arrays. Um, I have heard if you know what you're doing, they're a great inspection tool that you can potentially find damaged arrays. I personally have never done that. I think uh, if you're doing drone inspection, roof inspections, um, you're still going to look for the same things. Obviously, you're not going to be able, to, if you're not getting on the roof, which we're not required to, um, you're obviously, you're not going to grab things. You're not going to be uh, making sure everything's stable and, and tight, but the uh, a drone will will tell you then if, if anything is looks out of the ordinary or has some issues. For inspection purposes, wouldn't these be hidden by paneling, meaning we wouldn't be able to see these? Okay, Aaron, um, yes and no. Um, the There's going to be a gap between, uh, I really wish I could find, find the pictures that I had. Let's see, because I had a couple of really good pictures that I could show you that that kind of shows what you would see. Uh, and I apologize for not having those ready. Um, Not to use it as as an excuse, but I uh, battling a little bit of COVID symptoms today, so obviously I was not a hundred percent with my preparation this afternoon, and I apologize for that. Uh, yeah, I just do not have those pictures available right now, and I apologize. Um, as far as electrical flow from the array to the panel, let me try and open. Okay, so uh, Rob, when doing a regular home inspection on a one-story home, I like to go on foot. Should I give the panels a wiggle? I do. I make sure they're attached firmly to the rails and, and that the rails are attached firmly to the roof. Obviously, I check the flashing for these boxes and eyeball the wiring. What else should be inspected? That That's really kind of it. Uh, you might take a look at um, 
any penetrations going in the roof. Um, so if we go back to this, you can see right here in the center of this box, that's actually penetrated through the roof. Um, our goal would be if we can't see the actual penetration, if it's flat down on the roof, we're gonna wanna see all the way around the box having some kind of sealant, whether it's silicone, uh, caulking, some, some things like that. So as far as the, the flow of the electrical, um, so Doug asked if we could step you through the electrical flow from the array to the service panel. So over here on the left, we've got the, the PV panels, the arrays. They're going to go through to this combiner box. And these actually, this particular combiner box has breakers in it. So the, the power is going to come to these. And that's going to flow through these conductors into this disconnect. From the disconnect into the pan, into the meter, the production meter, if, if it's required. Uh, like say our local utility one of the four requires it the other three don't um it'll, then it comes through in here and it inside the the panel the load center the breaker box it'll be attached one of two ways if it's coming into the breaker box it will be attached either onto a breaker that's correct size for the the arrays or it will be tapped directly onto the service conductors coming from the meter into the panel. So the what happens is for this to work, this combiner box, this is where all the, the magic happens. So the combiner box converts everything from DC to AC that, that allows it to go back onto the grid or into the panel. Um, it also, it's if it's not producing, if these are not producing voltage, it's got voltage coming into it. It has to sense the voltage coming into that inverter. Otherwise, it will not allow the power to come back out of it. If that makes sense, it's kind of it's kind of working both ways. It has to see utility power coming to the inverter um, for it to work. Again, here in the combiner box, the inverter. This actually is where it turns the DC to AC and flows it back this way. Does that answer your question, Doug? Uh, Preston asked if we reinspect if a roof is replaced. Um, at this point, um, that gets a little, I don't want to say sketchy with us because um, roof inspections have been an issue for us. We We finally got a full-time inspector that all he does is roof inspections um, he is supposed to contact us if there's a roof that he is going to inspect with a, a solar array on it um, to my knowledge we haven't gotten that call from him yet in theory yes we have to go back and, and re-inspect that but sometimes that that falls under the if we don't catch him we don't know about it kind of thing unfortunately Um, does the AHJ require a certain voltage system? We don't require a certain voltage system. Um, that's typically dictated by the uh, manufacturer of the, the arrays. Um, we don't have a specific voltage that re we require. All right, everybody, I really appreciate 
everybody uh, being here. And you guys have asked some great questions. I really appreciate everything you guys have asked. Um, I want to thank you all for, for joining. And uh, if you have any more questions, um, I'm sure you can reach out to, to the guys at Internashi and they, they can forward any questions along to me. Thank you guys. Thanks, everyone.